Blog Talk Radio. today about a subject that's familiar and near and dear to my heart. So let's let, let's ask a question, throw it out there to you to kind of get our thoughts going. If I were to ask you what type of Christian you are, how would you answer that? Would you answer with a denominational label? Would you answer uh, by simply just giving a, a vague reference such as evangelical or just even just Christian? Well, if you were to ask me this same question only a few years ago, here's basically what I could tell you. What type of Christian are you? Well, I'm a soul-winning, sin-hating, Bible-thumping, liberal-bashing, KJ-reading, raising-the-standard-high, independent, fundamental Baptist. Well, a few years ago, that might have fit where I was at. Today's program, we're going to veer back into the subject of fundamentalism and look behind the scenes, so to speak, about this, I think we could call it a cultural phenomenon that may be in its, in its waning days, at least I hope so, but we're going to be talking with someone who's been there and done that, so I'm thrilled to be joined today by our guest, Daryl Dow, the manager of one of my favorite blogs, Stuff Fun It's Like, and also the author of a new book we'll be talking about today. Daryl, welcome to our program. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me. So, Daryl, are you a soul-winning, sin-hating, Bible-thumping, dot, 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 fundamental Baptist anymore? Not anymore. <laughs> it's been a while. Well, let's let's talk about that. Um, well, actually, well, you just written your book, Fundamental Flaws, available at Amazon. And uh, tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book, because you were a met, uh, you were in this this realm, this world before, and uh, now you're kind of uh, known for taking a look back at that and kind of having some fun, but tell us um, why you decided to write this book, and uh, just tell us a little bit about the book itself, what they can, what readers can expect to find. Okay. Well, the uh, the book itself, it, let's start there, is it's pretty, it's fairly short, actually. It's a short ebook. It's only about 30 pages long. Um, what I what I did with the book is I condensed some of the uh, best of Stuff Mondays Like posts, some of the best of the material, organized it into seven topics. Uh, and um, then looked at these seven key areas and kind of drilled down a little bit into just kind of my thoughts, my opinions on what's wrong with uh, the fundamentalist movement, and uh, then a few very short, pithy statements about what I think could possibly help uh, to improve to improve the movement overall. Um, for those people who are interested in you know, improving it instead of just leaving it, as so many of us have done. And for why why I wrote the book, I just thought that there's a lot of material out there on the blog. Uh, sometimes some of it gets lost. Uh, you you read a post every day, or you know, I, I write new material about once a week, twice a week now, and I post other material, you know, videos and so on, along with that, just funny or silly things or strange things. But I thought that putting all this all together in one place might be helpful to folks who kind of want to get a feel for uh, what is fundamentalism, why, you know, aren't you a fundamentalist anymore, what do you, what's your problem, man, you know, with all this, uh, this going on, as well as uh, kind of giving people who already strongly suspect that uh, there's some problems in fundamentalism something to sink their teeth into. I want people to, you know, when they've left and people ask them, why don't you go to that, that church anymore, they can kind of pick up this book and go, well, this is why. <laughs> In a nutshell, these, this is the stuff that's, you know, these are the reasons why. Um, so I, I, that was kind of, you know, my general thought behind that. 
Well, we're talking with Daryl Dow of Stuff Fundies Like, author of the new book, Fundamental Flaws. And if you want to join us here on the program, the phone number to call in is 818-431-8528. That's 818-431-8528. To eight. Also, we do have the chat room is open. If you don't, if you want to get your views out there or, or drop a question or a comment, but you don't want to definitely be on the air, you can do it right there in our live chat room. Well, Daryl, let's talk about what what exactly is a fundamentalist because there is a lot of confusion about that. If you listen to the media, you might hear someone talk about uh, the late Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson as fundamentalists. Yet. Within our fun version of fundamentalism, they would be very far from that. In fact, they would be hated and condemned. On the other hand, you might have a, a, a historical look. Folks like J. Gresham Machen uh, might be labeled a, as a fundamentalist. But that's really not what we're talking about. What is a, a fundamentalist that you're talking about on the blog and in the book? That's a, you know it's a great question. It's it's almost you know it's like nailing the proverbial jello to the wall to try to get a definition right. of fundamentalism because fundamentalists themselves can't seem to agree on what a fundamentalist is. So I, I all the time uh, you know this this is the the perennial and perpetual argument is are these people fundamentalists or aren't they? Can't, or do they deserve the name or don't they? You know are they oh these are really you know these are just fringe mm. people they're not real fundamentalists. And uh, so it, it always – it's always this, you know, and then you have the, the fundamentalists or the, the – some people call, the, you know, certain groups the fundy X uh, people or uh, the extreme mm. fundamentalists or the crazy fundies or, or whatever the case may be. Oh, they're not like us. So, uh, the, you know, the independent fundamental Baptist movement, I suppose, is sort of the, the general term for – or the general title given to a couple of different groups. That resemble each other with a high emphasis on uh, on authority, um, uh, a low trust environment, a heavy emphasis on um, very confrontational evangelism and very strict personal standards. Uh, so I, I guess you know then that would include uh, a couple of major colleges. I say major because you know that's all relative to you know the circle we're talking about. But there's a couple of uh, learning institutions. As well as some larger churches and pastors that kind of constitute, uh, you know, the leadership of this. Within inside of fundamentalism, though, there are what are referred to as camps. Uh, so even inside of that, you have people who are more or less at war with each other. Uh, Pensacola Christian right. College, you know, perennially shooting at Bob Jones University, and then you know, Hiles Anderson shooting at everyone, and then you know, whatever the case may be. So. Uh, it, it's very difficult to, to nail this down, but they come from, tend to come from the same basic roots. It's just that since one of their great uh, tenets of their faith is separation from those who are liberal, evil, or wrong, that they continually split, they continually splinter into smaller and smaller groups um, that you know have suddenly discovered, oh no, we've found a better way than you know. So you have to go to Hiles Anderson, and then from there you you know you find people. Like uh, Steven Anderson, um, you know, out there now he's he's anti Hiles, you know, he's doing his own thing, you know, uh, very uh, popular on the internet for certain videos that he's put out. But uh, you know, he, he's he's a, a great example of a sort of splinter group, you know, that's moved on beyond Hiles. And oh no, we're more holy than Hiles is because mm. we found a better way. So it, it continually continually happens. So that's a very yeah, long answer there's... to a very simple question. Well, yeah, it's, it's one of those questions I hate getting, so that's why I give it to you. Um, how would, you know, are you a fundamentalist anymore? Because it, 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 it is like kneeling fellow to a wall. Because you don't know, you, you have the more conservative folks out there, like the folks maybe from Bob Jones, or even play, folks you don't even really know how to how to handle, even like a, a Northland or a Clearwater. Um, those Christian colleges who were uh, arguably once more fundamentalist now moving in a I don't want to say the word progressive, you know, just, you know that's a bad word. Um, but they're moving in a, in a different direction. But then you've got people holding the line, like you know, Pensacola, who would have differences with Hiles, and who knows anymore um, what just what a fundamentalist is. So, well, Daryl, give us your personal story. Uh, you mentioned in your prologue, kind of mimicking the Apostle Paul giving your credentials. Um, just where was your part in all of this, in this whole story of fundamentalism? Um, well, I, I kind of goes back to, you know, my very just very briefly, and I, I've, you know, people who followed me have heard this story a few times before, but it, it kind of starts back with my grandfather. 
Um, my grandfather uh, got saved uh, when he was in the uh, military um, back in the 1950s. When he uh, left the military, he went to Bob Jones University um, and got his degree there in uh, pastoral ministries, became a missionary, then became a pastor. My father followed in his footsteps, became a missionary, then became a pastor. He graduated from Pensacola Christian College. Uh, so then the next generation was me, and I you know, also went to Pensacola Christian College, but I did not get a degree in ministry. I got a degree in computer science instead. Of course, when I got out, coming from a ministry family, I was, uh, I was a deacon. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a music director at a church. Um, you know, I did all of those types of things. But as time went along, I began to read more. I began to think more. I began to interact with people who had left fundamentalism on the Internet, elsewhere. And, uh, of course, I went through the normal stages. The, the first stage is, you know, sort of, uh, oh, there's nothing wrong here. You people just need to, you know, get right with God uh, and agree with me, and then everything will be fine in the world. The next stage is, oh, there's a few problems, but nothing we can't fix. Yeah, there are a few crazy people out there, but they're not us. Uh, and then you begin to get further and further into it and realize that the, really the entire system of thought is, is corrupted. The entire way of approaching the truth, the way of approaching the scriptures, uh, the way of approaching church has been uh, just completely turned around so that uh, people now exist to kind of serve these organizations as opposed to the organization serving the people. Um, that are in them, and and you know so on and so forth. I've been I've been privileged to know a lot of fundamentalists who are very decent human beings. Um, I would list you know my father and my grandfather among them. They're unfortunately though, even as as good intentioned as people are, I think that there's a lot of harm that's done sometimes through the the idealism and through the general uh, way of viewing the world. In that if we just uh, hold to these things, then everything will be okay, you know, and, and not understanding that some issues are more complex than we give them credit for being. Um, that people, you know, have deeper problems sometimes than what we fix with a, a gospel slap or a, a you know, biblical band-aid. Um, so it's uh, it's been a process of learning. As I've, I've said before, elsewhere, I you know, my process of leaving was very slow. It was more like continental drift than, uh, you know, a sudden bang, uh, but through one thing and another, eventually I began about four years ago. As a matter of fact, in a couple of days, it'll, we'll have a fourth year anniversary on stuff like uh, on the blog. Uh, just you know, four years writing down these various things and interacting with so many people, uh, so many different stories of things that have happened. Honestly, I I had it easy. Um, I grew up on the mission field um, for the most part with my with my parents. I wasn't. In these churches, um, every day, my dad is a very decent guy, um, you know, not in any way, you know, abusive or anything like that. So uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I got off easy uh, compared to, you know, some other things that these folks have grown up in some of these churches with dictator pastors and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, we all have our stories. We're all entitled to them. So uh, that's kind of my background, where I come from. And, and the great thing about growing up in a missionary family is that I got to travel a lot. So we'd come back on furloughs and spend an entire year just going to church after church after church, mission conference after missions conference after missions conference, interacting with other missionaries, interacting with pastors, seeing all kinds of situations. And, and of course, you know, pastors love to talk to other pastors. So as a as a 12, 14, 16-year-old kid, I'm sitting there listening to these, these stories, seeing these men, uh, hearing all of this stuff. So... That a lot of that has to, is very foundational, very formative in uh, some of the you know the things that are right now. Um, kind of. All right, we've got a phone call here, and I want to sit this guy in here. So um, okay, let's see. We have a caller on the line. Caller, can you hear us? Hey, I'm Dean from New York City. Well, hello. What what's your question for Daryl? Well, I, I know just identification, a comment, if I may. Um, I uh, I grew up in the church all actually positive experiences. Hello, are you still there, caller? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello? Uh, I'm hearing you kind of cutting in, cutting out. Daryl, are you are you hearing the same thing or? Yeah, it's it's a little. It's we're having a little bit of communications issue there. I think. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. I, I, I can hear you. 
Oh, sorry about that. I'm I'm on a cell, so I, I mean my reception might not be that good. But um, no, I was saying that I grew up. I also grew up in, in the church, and uh, I actually had a lot of very good experiences. But um, at some point, uh, uh, I felt somewhat disillusioned uh, about the culture because it didn't seem. Hello. Yes. Yeah, we were we're hearing you. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it, it just it didn't seem some of the. I, again, I live in New York, and and I I got to a point. I wanted to become a missionary myself. I was. My goal was to um, uh, go to Moody Bible College and join the Aviators. You know, I wanted to be a uh, uh, missionary and fly planes and you know the, the Bibles in the jungles of South a- in South America or, or Africa. But I, somehow, uh, I mean, Lord forgive me, I, I got somewhat sidetracked from that. But um, if anything, for me, uh, I think that the fundamentalism. Uh, it is really the, the 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 saving grace of the religion. Uh, sometimes you, you'll have holy rollers and some who follow who become charismatic. And I remember growing up the the statement that don't be so heavenly minded that you know good. I've met people like that, but 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 the new age kind of uh, a religion. I, I've met pastors who uh, who are advocating for homosexuality, not 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 the salvation of the homosexual, but actually advocating for homosexuality. You know, I, I've met people who are deviating from the role of women in the church, you know, and, and things of that nature. So so I, I think, um, again, I, I think that, that I, I have observed some backwardness among the fundamentalists, uh, but, but I found that, that more of it is more positive in my experience. That they're mostly depository uh, of what I think Jesus really wanted uh, for his for the body of Christ, than not, uh, if I may say. Sure. Well, 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 thanks very much for your comments, Daryl. Um, what do you say? I mean, is there is is fundamentalism the uh, saving grace of our country now that uh, things are getting a little more liberal, progressive, heading that direction? You know, I, I, that's 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 generally speaking how fundamentalists tend to view themselves um and and i i completely understand that point of view because i uh i was part of that and had that view of myself for many years uh, we're the we're the last line of defense we're pretty much what's standing between uh the church and all out liberalism um you know whatever that may be um but the the numbers simply don't agree uh the the general effect of fundamentalism on the culture is simply not there. Maybe it was once upon a time. There used to be a considerable amount of political clout. Um, you know, way back when you know, uh, First Baptist of Hammond was running the largest Sunday school in the country, and all this kind of thing. Uh, there was a point in time when you could say that uh, some, you know, the, the largest churches. I mean, fundamentalism basically invented the mega church. Um, as you know, as the, the large church, the, the you know, the big huge ministry. It simply doesn't exist that way anymore. So I think that that in a in a very real sense, if your measuring stick is uh, oh well, you know we they're they're the only ones left who are speaking out against these whatever these activities may be or whatever these positions may be, it doesn't even really make sense there because I mean you have the entire Southern Baptist Convention, the largest you know religion right. in the country. Uh, speaking out against those same things, but fundamentalists would definitely not consider the Southern Baptists to be fundamentalists. Um, now, whether some of them fit that role or not is a, is a matter of you know some further discussion. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, uh, you know that. So I, I, it doesn't. It, it's, it's easy to have a bunker mentality and say, "Oh, we're the you know we're the the last line of hope for the country," but unfortunately, it, it really doesn't measure up to reality. No, it doesn't. And you know, just as Elijah had to be. Reminded, there there are many who have not bowed the knee, and many of them make women who are wearing pants or attending the movie theater. Um, there are, there are many who are are still speaking out against whether it's homosexuality or um, you talked about the New Age movement. There are a lot of people writing about that who would not have this <laughs> fundamentalist bent. Um, but that does bring up I, I, there is you mentioned it. But there, there is that that mentality, that bunker mentality that says we're the only people who are doing this. Those guys who are, um, who are also speaking out on these issues. Well, they're not really good Christians because they're still, you know, they still have rock music in their churches and they still have. So they're compromised. So we can't count them. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can't count anybody, really. I mean, the true church is me and thee, and I have my doubts about thee. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, the, the the divisiveness of the entire movement is one of its downfalls, and ultimately, it will be the downfall. Uh, however, people who leave fundamentalism often take fundamentalism with them. So, I, honestly, in my opinion, the one of the reasons why, and I brought up the Southern Baptist Convention a little bit, you know, earlier, is that one of the reasons why that that organization has tilted right in recent years, I believe personally, is that a lot of people who were part of more independent churches have gone over to the Southern Baptist side as their own movement crumbles around them. They're looking for something to, to join into, uh, but unfortunately, they're taking a lot of those types of things with them. So now we have this, these these amazing struggles, inner struggles going on in that particular organization between folks who you know want to want to take the organization in one direction or another, but. Regardless of that, there, there are all kinds of places where fundamentalists end up. Uh, you know, they end up as fundamentalist Calvinists or fundamentalists whatever. Uh, not that there aren't some independent Baptists who are Calvinists, but um, you know, they end up as in, fundamentalist Reformed, or they end up joining, uh, you know, one of these uh, vision forum type organizations or something like that, and just just running off into a different direction. Still, every bit is uh, committed to that kind of idea that we're the only ones doing this right. Um, you know, some of them vote for Ron Paul. It's, it's just, it just it just depends on you know which which place you go. And that that's a shout out to all my you know Ron Paul fan friends. But I uh, don't want to get down okay, too far down that, that road. Email to Daryl, not to me. Um, <laughs> I've had my experiences with the Ron Paul people. I'm one of the Ron Paul people, but I'm not one of the spammer uh, people upset with. Anyway, um, they know my blog, and they'll know they they can crash it later. But uh, uh, <laughs> you know, since you started. The stuff on these like blog. Um, I mean, you have tons and tons of you have people literally fighting to see who's first in your comment section. Um, <laughs> so you've had a lot of interaction with people. Um, has yeah. that been? How has that been? You talk about all these people are leaving. Um, has that helped you in your um, just your? I don't want to say recovery, but I'll say it, recovery. Um, how has that experience been? Just meeting up with all these different people. It, it it's very interesting because. At the at the same time, you have two very different ideas going on. You, first of all, it's nice to know that you're not alone. Everybody kind of gets that, and people who show up to the blog for the first time almost inevitably make that comment. I thought I was the only one who'd done this. You know, I thought I was the mm. only person who felt this way. Especially people who are still in a fundamentalist church. Um, I'm still in a fundamentalist church because my husband will never leave because mom, you know, I'm only 17 and my my parents still go there and so I can't leave yet or whatever the case may be, um, you know. So they show up and they're like, oh, we just found this place where I realize I'm not crazy, okay? I'm not the only person seeing that there are problems here. Uh, on the other hand, the stories are so vastly different from each other sometimes. Um, some of the themes are the same. But just as, you know, my story is rather eh, unremarkable in some ways in that, you know, I didn't go through a lot of things, although I could, you know, possibly share some stories from my college experience or some other things that kind of give the lie to that. But nonetheless, I, I didn't go through, you know, these huge personal bouts of, of uh, abuse or, or just mind games, all these kinds of things. But other people did. I mean, I talked to people who survived Heps of the House or one of those types of organizations. Mm -hmm. I talked to people who, you know, have been through just terrible, terrible things. Um, so on that hand, it, in some ways, it almost makes me more thankful for what I did go through. In that, you know, I kind of dodged the bullet in a big way on some of those types of things. Well, let's talk. Let's actually get into your book now that our time is slipping away from us. Uh, you mentioned seven different issues in the book, and I want to focus on a couple. I think the for me, I, I really enjoyed the, the section on the church, the idea, and I'm going to read this quote here because I think it's, in my opinion, one of the best of the book. Um, and it just sums up, I think, some of the hypocrisy that you see. And, and, and that's it. It's not even a, a conscious hypocrisy, but talking about the idea of communion. If you can believe that praying a blessing over every meal, including the nachos you had during a ball game, is a meaningful act of thanksgiving, but also believe that taking of communion every week makes it somehow an empty ritual that they would probably make a good fundamentalist. I think that sums up a lot of good things there. Um, but what was it that was missing from the church? You talk about communion, you talk about the gospel being missing, and even Jesus. That doesn't make these guys sound to be the 
the saving grace of of religion today. Uh, what what is the hypocrisy going on here? What what do you think accounts for this? I, I think there's I think there's basically two. It boils down to two very important things. The first of all is that last one that you mentioned. Jesus is missing. He he's simply not there. He's not there in the the songs. He's not there in the sermons. He he's hardly you know there. Communion is missing. Uh, there's just a lot of things going on where Jesus is simply not present. We don't hear about him because he's not. He doesn't make a good fundamentalist. He's a little bit too out there. He's uh, he's forgiving people all the time and loving people and you know making and wine. His testimony I mean, was just, ruined hanging out with the people he's hanging out with. Exactly. People didn't like him all that much. So I mean, he kind of looks a little bit like a hippie sometimes, and we don't really <laughs> care for that. So we have to be really, really careful what we do with Jesus and fundamentalism. And so that that's the first piece of it, and the second piece is simply this this love for our fellow man is missing. So we kind of we've kind of, you know, the greatest two commandments in the law. We've kind of ruined both of them. We love God. Well, who is God? That Jesus is. You know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we we we've left that. Love your your neighbor. Well, we we've kind of isolated ourselves so much we don't even know who our neighbor is, much less be able to really love him in any kind of meaningful way. And we've translated love our neighbor. And to share the gospel with our neighbor. That's the only right. way we know how to like reach out and and deal with people. So when we have a disaster, I shared a video on my blog recently. We have a disaster, you know, this disaster is uh, Superstorm Sandy hits and people are, are dead. People, you know, have lost loved ones. And this pastor sits in his study and says, oh, well, you know, we need to really think about praying that, that uh, God will use all these deaths and disaster to, you know, to get people saved. And I'm like, that's it? That's that's the answer, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's not, hey, you know, give your money to the Red Cross, or, hey, we're taking up a collection of, you know, to try to help some of these people out. You know, even just help Christians out, even just rebuild churches or whatever needs to be done up there. No, we, that, well, that's not important. We just need to pray for their souls. You know, eventually they'll get saved, and then what happens to their body is immaterial. Mm. And I think that, that attitude about... – in... go ahead. Go ahead. I just think that attitude in general is one of the things that just uh, you know permeates whether they know it or not. It just permeates the entire movement, and it really makes it ineffective. I want to talk a little bit about missions, but you kind of hit on some of that, and uh, even getting into to your, you took a, a mission trip just recently with World Vision, um, and I'm mm-hmm. sure you know your whole perspective has changed um, in part because of that. But um, we're, we're running out of time, and I want to hit on one really important issue here. And I think it's one of the the most dangerous features of some forms of fundamentalism, and that is the issue of authority. The man of God who really is ruling like a tyrant over people who claim to love liberty and Ron Paul supporters and all that stuff. Um, talk to us just a little bit. Uh, give us a what, what should be be looking out for in, in one of these pastors, and I, I think this really is a dangerous but crucial issue. You want a pastor who does not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Uh, Someone who is willing to apologize when he's wrong, to be willing to consider new information when it comes to him. Um, When when somebody comes to him after a Sunday morning service and says, hey, you, you preach this, how does this match up with you know this other scripture. Maybe you took that verse out of context. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, outside of my dad, who you know I have these conversations with on, on a regular basis, or I did when I was growing up, I, I don't know too many fundamentalist pastors who would would be all that happy with a congregant coming up to them and saying, "Hey, you completely missed the point of that, <laughs> that scripture verse that you used." Um, they they would they would consider that to be evil questioning, uh, not uh, not something very helpful. So. You, you want a, a situation where you're comfortable keeping the people in your church accountable, uh, whether that's the pastor, whether that's the, the deacon board, whatever it is. People in the pew should be comfortable enough with their own uh, their own place in the church uh, to to do that. So I think that that really is what it boils down to. And when you when you see these situations, these terrible terrible situations that happen, something like. Well, I'm sorry to you off, Carolyn. We've got to go. Our, our show's just about to wrap up. I just want to mention real quickly before, before we go. Our caller uh, did want to emphasize that he didn't think everything was positive about fundamentalism. Not too much negative. 